Get recording. Well, good morning, everybody. So good to be here and share with you from God's word. I'd like you, if you would, to turn in the book of Acts, please. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. And we're going to read the first 19 verses of Acts chapter 12. Acts 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garments about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing he came to the house of mary the mother of john whose surname was mark where many were gathered together praying and as peter knocked at the door of the gate a damsel came to hearken named rhoda when she knew peter's voice she opened not the gate for gladness but ran in and told how peter stood before the gate and they said to her thou art mad but she constantly affirmed that it was even so then said they, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. What was become of Peter? And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So I've got a title this morning for the message, and it's called The Great Escape. Now, there used to be a famous movie about that, about an escape from a German prisoner of war camp. But this is an even greater escape, and it's an amazing thing. Now, I'm going to give a big word for the, the children here. I wonder how many of them know what the word is. But if you don't know, you can ask your parents, and they can tell you what it is. And it's a word parenthesis, okay? A parenthesis or a parenthetical passage. And what that means is that this passage that I've just read actually is squeezed in in between the flow of the story it really doesn't follow on the story now let me explain what i mean if you look at the end of chapter 11 you notice it says in 11 verse 27 in those days came prophets from jerusalem to antioch there stood up one of them named agapus and signified by the spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of claudius caesar then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren which dwell in Judea, which also they did, and sent to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And then if you look at chapter 12, verse 25, it says, 
and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And so it's like chapter 11, the story continues at chapter 12, 25, and in between is squeezed in this story that really isn't part of the flow. But, so you might ask, well, why is it there? Now, why, why did the Holy Spirit put it there in the middle of the general flow of the story? And part of the reason is that Holy Spirit's almost done with Jerusalem. We're about to move on. Jerusalem's no longer the center of the, the story. Antioch has become the center of the story. And so from chapter 13 onwards, it's all going to be about Antioch and what happens from there. And so he just wants us to know, well, Jerusalem's not completely forgotten. God was still working in Jerusalem, although now he's going to be working from Antioch. He's still working in Jerusalem. So it wants us to know that God is still working in Jerusalem at this time. And so there's this particular story that's inserted to tell us about some of the events uh, in Jerusalem and particularly ab ab about Peter. Because what's interesting is that in the first half of the book of Acts up to now, Peter's been the star of the show, in a sense. I mean, he's, he's mentioned 51 times. And after chapter 12, he's only going to be mentioned once. He he's just kind of fades off the story. So, we wanna, well, what about Peter? What happened to him? What, 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 what went on? And then, of course, Paul is going to become the center of the show from chapter 13 onwards. So it's a big change. So this story, this great escape, it, there had been a period of peace after Saul was converted in chapter 9 and verse 31. It tells us that after Saul of Tarsus, who was the great persecutor, it said, then had the churches rest through all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, walked in the fear of the Lord. So, so the, there was a time where the churches were experiencing great persecution, but when Saul got saved, that time of persecution, it meant there was a kind of period where they could breathe easily. The, kind of, the pressure was off, but it wasn't for long. And the persecution begins again. But this time, the persecution is different. It's not just the Jews that are doing the persecution, uh, as in the past, now it's actually the government that are persecuting under Herod, the king. It, it's kind of an official political persecution. And the reason, of course, we're going to see is that uh, it, it actually made Herod popular with the Jews. Uh, so he did it just for popularity. It's amazing what politicians will do for popularity. They'll promise you everything, the earth, moon, and stars, if you'll just vote for them, right? I mean, they're just they love power. That's the bottom line. They love power and they like to hold on to their power and they'll do whatever it takes to keep it. And so we've got an example of that here with this man, Herod. Now, Herod was from a terrible, terrible family in a sense. Terrible in this way that there's kind of a history in the Herod family of opposing God. Oh, you don't want that reputation, right? What a, what a terrible history. You see, his, Herod's grandfather, this Herod here, Herod the king here that's mentioned, his grandfather, well, remember when Jesus was born and he, he had been, his grandfather had been told that another king Jesus was born. And he felt threatened by this another king Jesus. And so he tried to wipe out all the boys that were born about that. Remember that all at two years and under, he had them all wiped out. So he, he murdered all these, these two-year-old toddlers and younger. Isn't that terrible? That's his grandfather. Imagine having a grandfather like that. That wouldn't be a good thing. But not just that, he also had an uncle called Herod Antipas. And he's the guy that had John the Baptist beheaded. So... Like, this is not a, it's not looking good, is it? This is, uh, this is a pretty bad dynasty. And now with this comes uh, Herod uh, Agrippa, our new Herod. And of course, Herod is a bit like Caesar. You know, it's kind of a name that's used for their position. Uh, it's not necessarily their surname. And so now this Herod Agrippa, he decides that he's going to do something bad as well. And he persecutes the church. And so he stretched his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. 
And so he kills one of the apostles. Remember, James and John were brothers, and uh, they were called the sons of thunder. And apart from Judas, who killed himself, this is the first of the apostles to actually die. Now, just an aside, this is kind of an interesting thing. When Judas died, what did they do? Well, they got a replacement, right? Because we've got to have 12. Now James dies, but they don't get a replacement. Now, why is that? Because they only need 12, because in the kingdom, in the millennial kingdom, when Jesus reigns for a thousand years, those 12 original apostles are going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we need 12 to do that, but we don't have what some people call apostolic succession, okay? So, so, so the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, they believe in apostolic succession and that they're in the long line of the apostles and they, you know, kind of that when they died, they got replaced by them. And eventually, eventually it's them who are now the chief guys. No, 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 that's not what the Bible says. No replacement for James. And it says they killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, depending on who you read, uh, some say that he was beheaded. Uh, one commentator said that he was actually, uh, he was killed with a sword and he was cut lengthways from the middle of his head all the way down. Uh, whatever way it was, he was killed by Herod. He arranged it. He had his execution to do it. And this man died. And it is interesting that he was one of the two that his mother was very ambitious. And if you look back at Mark's gospel, just for a moment, Mark chapter 10, we, we read that uh, the, the mother of James and John wanted them when Jesus reigned in, as king, he wanted, uh, she wanted the two boys to sit on the right hand and the left hand, you see, they wanted to kind of have these positions of glory. And so the Lord has said, verse 37, they said to him, uh, this is Mark 10, 37, they said to him, grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand, the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said to them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we can. But Jesus said to them, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, shall you be baptized, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And so the Lord said, um, can you go through what I'm going to go through before I am glorified and made king? I have to suffer. I have to go to the cross. I have to suffer there. Can you go through suffering before you reign in glory? I would say, oh, yeah, we can do that. No problem. So I said, OK, let's just see how it goes. And that's exactly what happened. James lost his head. Now, John, it's interesting how these two brothers, J James is the first apostle, apart from Judas, to die. And John is the last apostle to die as an old man of natural causes. So it wasn't that he didn't suffer, though, because he was banished to an island. And the tradition tells us he was even boiled in oil and survived. Now, I don't know how that could be possible, except for divine protection. But I, I want to tell you, he suffered. He had his baptism. And so these men were both suffering for the Lord Jesus. And so we're told in verse three, because he saw it please the Jews, it made him more popular. And that's what this man wanted. He proceeded further to take Peter. He think, well, if I can get Peter, well, I'm going to really go up in the, in the, in the, uh, the Gallup polls uh, in, in society. I'm going to be, I'm going to be really uh, well respected and liked. And so he took Peter, but he also had a bit of a problem because it was a Jewish feast called unleavened bread, which included the Passover. And so he realized it, it wouldn't be a good time to do it then because people might get a bit upset. You know, there could be riots, there could be trouble. And so he waited till after it was over and he was planning to execute Peter, but God had other plans. And so it says in verse five um, that, um, so verse four, when they had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. Now that simply means four groups of four. Okay, a quaternion was a group of a squad of four soldiers. And so he, he now has four fours. Okay, so four groups of four that are meant to guard uh, Peter. Now, 
why did he have so many men? 16, right? Is that um, math was never my subject. I think that's right, right? Four, four. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that your affirmation because math was never my subject. So, so 16 soldiers to look after one unarmed man. <laughs> wow, that's pretty. Why did they do that? Well, this is not the first time Peter's been arrested. This is actually his third imprisonment in just a short time. Amazing. Three times he's been in prison, and every time he's got released. Uh, sometimes because they didn't have sufficient, uh, well, they just warned him the first time. But the second time, chapter 5, verse 18, it says uh, <clears throat> they laid their hands on the apostles. This is chapter 5, verse 18, and put them in prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. So the angel of the Lord had helped them escape once before. So Herod says, you're not going to do it this time. Uh, I'm going to make sure that we, isn't it amazing what man tries to do? Remember when the Lord Jesus was buried and they said that he's going to rise on the third day and they said, make the sepulcher sure right you know big group of soldiers uh, seal the tomb and all the rest of it and and it's just amazing there's just an earthquake the whole thing is gone and there's an angel sat on top of it and it's like the lord saying you see you can't do anything that you want to do i'm in charge here isn't it good to know god's in charge Amen. i find it encouraging because the elite are still plotting and scheming and they've got all kinds of ideas and they can only do what God allows them to do. And if he says enough's enough, enough's enough. They can't go any further. So good to know he's in control. And so it says that you have these four squads of four. And two of them were chained to Peter. So every time they changed shift, you know, they, they were chained to Peter. And so it seems like he, he's in a very difficult situation. But then it says in verse 5, but, but Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God. I want you to notice that word, but. I really like that. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer. <laughs> I want you to just get that. You know, but prayer. Prayer was made to God. And, and it's amazing. One of the great themes that captivates the heart of Luke, both in his gospel and in the Acts, is prayer. He tells us more about the prayer life of the Lord Jesus in Luke than any other gospel writer. And in the book of Acts, he tells us about the early church, and they lived in the atmosphere of prayer. And you see it all the way through. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, if you want an assignment, you could read through the book of Acts and underline every time pray or prayer is mentioned. And you'll be amazed that you won't go many pages before you're underlining, underlining, underlining. All the way through the book. Uh, the church, the early church, the New Testament church were a praying people. And prayer was important. Very, In fact, when they had a problem, they had a prayer meeting. That's how they operated. They were a people devoted to prayer. And so great emphasis on that so but prayer was made now i just see this kind of prayer that was made it was constant prayer it's without ceasing they're constantly praying as soon as well i mean you could see why they would pray james has been executed and peter's arrested and and so they sensed a little bit of urgency here and so they prayed and they prayed constantly so constant prayer offered to god for him by the church and so these things really got them going. So it was constant prayer. It was without ceasing. It was de definite, specific prayer. It, notice it says prayer was made for him. It was, it was targeted prayer. It was for him. It was for Peter in his present situation. They weren't talking in vagaries or, or gen they were praying specifically for him, for Peter. And it was united prayer. It was without ceasing of the church unto God for him all for united constant specific prayer that will make a difference peter was bound but prayer was loosed i love that idea peter was bound but prayer was loosed and amazing things can happen when churches pray i wonder do we believe that amazing things can happen when churches pray 
So notice the timing of the answer to their prayers. It says, when Herod would have brought him forth the same night. Isn't that interesting? I mean, the Lord's timing is impeccable. Herod's about to take him out to execute him. And that same night, he's got these plans, but God has this plans. And he interrupts Herod's plans. And so it says, <clears throat> when Herod would have brought him out that same night, Peter was sleeping. Between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Now, I was thinking about a great series of messages on the great sleepers of the Bible. So Peter's always asleep. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, he's on Mount of Transfiguration, what's Peter doing? He's sleeping. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what's he doing? He's sleeping. And now, the night before he's supposed to be executed, what's he doing? He's sleeping be with chains between two guys. I mean, I don't know how you sleep, with because chains are noisy. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, they, they rattle, they make noise, but Peter sleeps. <laughs> and you've got others like that, too. Jonah, he slept in a storm in the bottom of a boat, right? I mean, there's a hurricane blowing in the, in, in the Atlantic, and he's a, or the Mediterranean, he's asleep. And then you've got Samson. Boy, what a sleeper he was. I mean, they're we weaving beams in his hair, and he's still sleeping. And then what about the church? All around the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and the church is largely sleeping. Mm -hmm. That would be an interesting series, wouldn't it? Sleeping. How could Peter sleep <clears throat> before he's supposedly going to be executed the next day and humanly speaking he's already witnessed james has been executed and he's next on the list but i believe that two things allowed him to sleep one was the prayers of the saints can bring calmness in the midst of the most tra 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 traumatic situations and secondly, I believe the promises of the word of God. And if you look back for a second to the gospel of John, chapter 21, John chapter 21, the Lord had told Peter about his death. And what he says in verse 18 and 19 of John 21, it says, Verily, verily, I say to thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So the Lord had promised Peter two things, that he's going to die when he's older, and that how he would die, he'd have his hands stretched out like the Lord Jesus be crucified, right? So, so he knew... This was not the occasion. One, I'm not old yet. And secondly, this is not how they're going to execute me. The Romans would use crucifixion. Herod would have him beheaded. And so he could sleep because said, yeah, you got all your plans, but God's word says otherwise. And so he is peaceful in the midst of great trial because he believes the word of God and he, the people of God are praying for him in the midst of his trial. Notice verse 7. It says, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. Again, he, obviously this guy, he obviously had to have a, a really loud alarm clock to wake him up, because, because he gets, the angel comes and gives him a slap, you know, wake up, <laughs> get up. And so, uh, of course, we, we find sometimes that's what really the church needs sometimes, I think, is a slap to wake us up, to get us up out of our slumber and, and cause us to, to, to uh, the, the chains of our besetting sins to be kind of put aside and, and to really live vigorously for God. And so, <clears throat> Peter, the angel, notice in verse 8, and this is a very important principle, the angel said to him, Gird thyself, bind on your sandals. So he did. And he said to him, cast your garments about you and follow me. I want you to notice that what the angel didn't do for Peter. He did for Peter what Peter couldn't do for himself. 
Peter couldn't break the chains. Peter couldn't get out of the prison. Like it needed supernatural help to get him out of the prison. But Peter could put his shoes on. Peter could get dressed. And so the Lord didn't do for him what he could do for himself. But what the Lord did was what he couldn't do for himself. And isn't that the base of prayer? Prayer is, is this idea that in prayer, we're asking the Lord to do things we can't do for ourselves. Like, let me give you an example. I can't save a soul. Can't do it. Now, I know what I can do. I can share the gospel. That's my part. The Lord won't do that for me, right? He's not going to let angels preach the gospel. It's our job. But the actual saving of the soul, that's what he does, right? So, so in prayer, it's this idea that, Lord, you got to do what I can't do. I'll do what you've told me to do, but there are things that, that, that only you can do. And so he, we get this wonderful balance here. God expects us to do what we can do, and he'll do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so verse 9, it says, he went out, followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but there, there thought he saw a vision. And I just get this picture. Peter feels like he's dreaming. I mean, is this really real? I mean, am I, am I, you know, he's a good sleeper. Am I dreaming all this, you know, that I'm just walking through, you know? And, and, and so he was, he was just in a state of shock that, that almost, it felt like he was dreaming. And so verse 10, it says, when they were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them. And of course, it wasn't, you know, the electronic gadgets that have a, you know, kind of a, a seeing eye that see you walk and then the door, no, none of that kind of stuff. They hadn't been invented yet. But it's, this is miraculous. The door opens and he walks right through. And again, just to remind ourselves, and I, I don't know if we'll fully be aware of all this until we get to glory. But the Bible tells us that angels are ministering spirits who are sent forth to minister to those that are the heirs of salvation. Amen. And I don't know. <laughs> we, sometimes we don't know. We, we might have entertained angels unawares. We didn't know that. But, but I, I think it's going to be fascinating when we finally get to heaven and the Lord gives us the rerun of our lives and, you know, when you got stuck in traffic and you were delayed and you were frustrated because you had to get to such and such a place at such and such a time. And maybe we'll find that maybe there was an angel stopping our path. I know so many stories of people who had experiences where it was clearly angelic intervention. And we've got to believe in the supernatural. If not, we're no, we're no better than the Sadducees. Right? Do we believe in angels? Well, well, we do, but do we believe they're actively involved in our lives? I hope we do. Uh, certainly involved here. Verse 11, when Peter was come to himself, <laughs> he realizes this is real. He said, now I know of a surety the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. What was the expectation of the people of the Jews? It was that Peter be dead. And he says, the Lord's delivered me out of all of this. And he knew it and it was very real. And so it says, verse 12, when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. I want you to notice that this is during the night. Like Peter was sleeping. They woke him up. There was a light shined into the prison because it's nighttime. And yet, guess what the church is still doing? They're still praying. They obviously weren't as scheduled as we are, right? I mean, uh, they believed in things like all-night prayer meetings. You see, I think there was a 24-hour watch on Peter uh, when it came to the, the, the four uh, groups of soldiers, right? They were guarding him 24-7, and I believe the saints were also praying 24-7 for Peter. And so there's this, this amazing prayer meeting that's still going on when he gets there. And, and, and it was night. We know that. Uh, verse 6 tells us when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. So this is a prayer meeting and it's going on at night. Verse 13, it says, Peter has knocked at the door of the gate and a damsel came to hark and named Rhoda. Rhoda simply means rose. She was named after a beautiful flower and her name is Rose. And she didn't open the gate immediately. Uh, perhaps initially for fear, because maybe more of Herod's soldiers were coming to get some more victims. She wasn't sure, so she's cautious. But then 
she hears a voice that's very familiar. When she knew Peter's voice, and I, I love that, just these little statements, she knew Peter. How did she know Peter's voice? Well, I reckon she'd heard him preach many times. She heard him retell the stories, what we call the Apostles' Doctrine, the events that Peter had been eyewitness to, and she'd heard him, and she'd heard him so much, she, she recognized his voice. It's interesting how that works, isn't it? I, I used to love listening to Warren Wearsby on the radio. Some of you may remember him. He was a tremendous Bible teacher, and he, he's hardly ever on anymore. You don't hear him on the radio, but I have some of his commentaries, and when I'm reading Warren Wearsby's commentaries, Guess what? I'm hearing his voice. <laughs> I can actually hear him. I mean, I don't, I don't have hearing issues, but, but you know, you just you read it and you can actually hear it in his, his distinctive uh, accent. And so she, she'd been so used to that voice. She knew that voice. She'd heard many sermons. And in her gladness and excitement, she runs to tell the praying saints, the Lord's answered our prayers. And she rushes in and, of course, leaves Peter stuck at the door. I mean, she's so excited. Uh, that, uh, that she doesn't even uh, do the necessary thing and let him in. But it's interesting, isn't it, that as she says, they, verse 15, they said to her, thou art mad. Interesting. She, she'd opened the gate for gladness, but ran in, told how Peter stood before the gate. They said to her, thou art mad. So do you think they were praying in faith? Lord, would you release Peter for us? Uh, you know, we, we don't want to lose this brother. Please deliver him. And now he, he comes, he's knocking at the door, and they say, you're mad to Rhoda. I mean, you lost your mind. You're crazy. Isn't it amazing? How much faith do you need, really? What did the Lord say? If you want to see a mountain move or you want to see prison gates open, or you want to see big things happen, you have to have faith as big as, oh, now what was it? Can anybody tell me? Mustard seed. Mustard seed. You ever seen a mustard seed? Pretty tiny, right? It's not the amount of faith. It's who the faith is in that matters, isn't it? It's, it's faith directed, even, no matter how small, to the living God who does move mountains, who does open prison gates. And, and so even though it was it's evident they're praying, and I'm sure they're very earnest, constantly praying, and yet perhaps they, they didn't have too much expectation on how much expectation we have when we pray. But the Lord's going to do things. We heard a testimony recently uh, of a brother who uh, went to an assembly that was small and dingy and very few people, and they were all Egyptians and, uh, or Arabic speakers, and they were praying because they lived in a community that was all Hispanic, and they were praying, Lord, how do we, how do we reach this Hispanic community? And uh, a guy got saved, and um, he led 20-plus others to the Lord, and, and uh, they were looking for a church. And they just showed up. These people were praying, how do we reach the Hispanic community? And the Lord delivers 20 plus of them to their door. They just walk in. I wonder if they were expecting that. I, I doubt they were expecting that <laughs> response. But the Lord gave them that response. Isn't that wonderful? That's, that's the way the Lord is sometimes. And so, so they're not really uh, genuinely kind of I mean, they're saying to this girl, you're crazy, you're off your head. But she instant in, is insistent, affirming, it's Peter. And they say, they say, thou art mad, but she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. That's a strange statement, isn't it? Now, we have to understand a little bit about the kind of Jewish thinking of this time. And they believed that every person had a guardian angel. And that every person's guardian angel could assume the, the exact form of that person. Like a, have you heard the word doppelganger? Somebody who's just like a, looks like, well, the angel could be like a doppelganger. He could, he could, he could uh, look exactly like that. So they said, oh, well, maybe it's his angel. Like the idea is that he's dead, but this is the angel. <clears throat> but she was affirming to them. 
No, no, no. It's Peter. And Peter's still knocking. That's the amazing thing. It says in verse 16, but Peter continued knocking. And he's outside knocking. And they're busy discussing everything. And he's knocking. Does that remind you of something else? See, there's another church, isn't there? Who were also busy with activity. And somebody's knocking at their door. It's not Peter. It's the Lord Jesus. The Laodicean church. And while they're busy conducting their activities inside, he's on the outside knocking and saying, hey, would anybody let me in? I actually like your fellowship. <laughs> but they've forgotten about it in their religious activity. And so <clears throat> Peter continues to knock. And it says, when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished they're, they're just amazed so what, what lessons can we draw at least from this little incident firstly we could say this that the early christians clearly were not expecting a miracle a minute because when one happened they're astonished right i mean they just they're blown away that it happened and sometimes you Hear people, and it's almost like as they talk about the New Testament, it was a miracle a minute, but it wasn't. Miracles by their very nature are unusual and not the norm. And so they weren't expecting a miracle a minute. They were earnest in their prayers, but taken by surprise when God answered. That's kind of shocking, isn't it? Earnest in their prayers, but taken by surprise when God answers. And so I suppose we could say, thirdly, that we should never underestimate the power of a praying church, even when it's weak in faith. Even when it's just mustard seed prayers. But God, who hears the prayers and the cries of his people. And I think that's important for us to recognize. They, they had mustard seed faith. It wasn't a lot. But, but doors can open when a church begins to pray. Things begin to happen. And if we are really serious about how do we move forward, and yes, we want to not stay the way we are. We want to change. We want to grow. We want to be all of these things. Can I suggest to you that the place where that should begin is the place of prayer? The prayer meeting, tragically, the least attended meeting of almost every assembly I know, and yet the most important meeting. Even, dare I say it, I, I think I have scriptural support, even more than the Lord's Supper. First Timothy 3, let me just say this, because I know that you'll go out of your way to get to the Lord's Supper, but you probably might not go out of your way to go to the prayer meeting. But in First Timothy 3, I think Paul nails it. When he simply says this, sorry, 1 Timothy 2, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. That phrase, first of all, means of first importance. That's the most, because that affects every other meeting. And I believe it does. And so verse 17, it says, <clears throat> but he beckoning unto them with the hands to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, go show these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Because this is not James the apostle, but James the half brother of the Lord Jesus, who became uh, one of the, the, the chief men of the church in Jerusalem. So go tell James this. But, but I want you just to notice too, that <clears throat> on the previous release, Peter was told in Acts 5 and verse 20, after he was released from prison, he was told that he should go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And yet now in Acts chapter 12, he's, he's released again. And when he's released, it just says he went to another place. He doesn't go to the temple. He doesn't start preaching. And what that tells us is that the Spirit can lead us in one direction one moment, 
and may lead us completely differently another moment. In other words, the leading of the Spirit can be different on different occasions. And so in this instance, uh, he's not told to go and preach all the words of this life, uh, but instead it says he just went to another place. He kept a low profile because he realized what's going on. This is Herod's out for blood. He's out to, to, to gain popularity politically, and uh, he's going to stop at nothing. And so Peter just takes a low profile. And in a very real sense, he just fades off. Apart from one showing up in Acts 15, he literally walks off the pages of the book of Acts. We only see him one more time. Not that he's not active, because his epistles would tell us he was very active. But as far as Luke is concerned, he's moving on now, and it's going to be uh, dealing with the Apostle Paul at center stage. Verse 18, tragically, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. Now, I just want you to use your sanctified imagination here. Here are these guys, they've been chained to this man during the night. Now, probably, if they were soldiers, they probably nodded off <laughs> at some point during the night. It's hard to stay up all night, really. Even when you have an all-night prayer meeting, it's hard to stay awake all night long. That's one of the challenges of it. And so they, here they are, and they're in, 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 they're in between, he's in between them. And when they will wake up, he's not there. The chains are there, but he's not there. Can you imagine the panic, the sheer panic in there? What happened? How did that happen? And they're discussing discussing the, the ones on the outside you know the, there's two on the inside two on the what did you do how did you how did you lose him i mean you're fools you were chained to him how could you ever lose him and they they don't have any explanation and sadly it would cost them their lives because it says <clears throat> when herod had sought for him found him not he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death now this was typical yeah, in this time if you lost the prisoners under your guard, you would be executed. You would suffer the same fate as the prisoner was to have himself. That's why the Philippian jailer, when we get to Acts chapter 16, when he thinks because of the earthquake, everybody's escaped, he's going to kill himself. Why would he want to do that? Well, because he'd rather do it himself. He'd seen how they do it. And he'd rather take it into his own hands. And Paul says, Stop. <laughs> We're all still here. Right? That's, that's the reason, because usually they were put to death. So verse 20, it says, Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. So now we move to another section. And I want to just, this is, the, this is an interesting bit, um, and I think a very sobering part. What happens? The chapter begins with Herod putting forth his hand to vex the church. The chapter ends with the Lord putting forth his hand to vex Herod. <laughs> and it's not a pretty sight. And we want to just recognize this. And I want to just read just a couple of verses from Romans chapter 12, because I was talking to some saints recently, and there's a tendency for us when we've been hurt, even by the Lord's people, there's a tendency for us to want to take matters into our own hands. And Romans 12, 17 says, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your en enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Be not be overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And so here we have a classic example of vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And he's going to take care of Herod. Now notice how this happens. It says Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. Now they're ports that are would be in Lebanon today, north of of, of the land of Israel, and it would seem that those ports, their, their activity was basically supported by the prosperity of the land of Israel, and so they were, they, their business was prospering because of that, and, and they were dependent on, on Israel and the trade from the land of Israel, dependent on business with supplies from what was Herod's jurisdiction, and somehow they had displeased uh, Herod, 
Herod was highly displeased with them, Tyre and Sidon. And so uh, perhaps he took his business to another port, went through Joppa instead or whatever. And so they were all upset because, because they're starting to feel the pinch because uh, uh, economically. And so they, they want to make a peace deal uh, with Herod and put things right. And so they came with one accord, uh, again, verse 20, to him, having made Blastus, the king, Chamberlain, their king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made a ration to them. Now, Josephus is very helpful here. So when the day came for this signing of this treaty of becoming friends again, and we're going to do business together again, it tells us that Herod had a garment that was made of shining silver. And it looked so marvelous that when the sun hit it, it was just dazzling to the eyesight. And so he looked amazing, uh, obviously had some kind of oratory skills because he begins to speak. And it really had an impression. And the people began to say that he was a god because he's shining and he's speaking eloquently. And so it tells us uh, that in verse 22, the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a god and not of a man. You know, since the very beginning in Genesis 3, Satan's temptation to human beings is to think that they can be like God. And this was going to be a major problem for the church because later the Roman emperors would declare themselves to be living deities. And if you didn't offer incense to them, then you were... Well, you were going to be a dead man. You'd be persecuted. And it's amazing because there's coming a day on planet Earth where another man is going to declare himself in the temple of God to be God, that man of sin. And he's going to do that. And even today, there are men that are acting like God. Some of the elites, they think that they are like God. And they tell you what you can have, which is nothing, and you'll be happy. Right? I mean, that's what they're telling us. Who gives them the right to determine what car I drive or what kind of house? I? Well, they think that they have some divine right. They're, they're playing God. And it's always a, a difficulty with man. It's satanic, isn't it? It's this idea of having more high of an opinion of yourself than you ought to think. They're just men of dust, but they think they're like God. And so they said, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Notice what it says. Immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. What we, we learn from Josephus, now I don't know how accurate he is, but he said that what actually happened was that he had a severe intestinal attack. Did this man, Herod, and five agonizing days later, he died. And when they did the autopsy, they found he was full of worms. You see, Josephus didn't say this, but it's probably true. He was a big sushi eater. And he's full of ringworms and all these other things. And, you know, and so this is, this is what Josephus said. Now, I don't know how the bottom line is. It's a very solemn thing to rob God of the glory that he alone is worthy of. And that's why Herod was dealt this blow. And notice he's eaten by worms. Now, I say all that to say this. We're kind of done, almost done here. But I want to just tell you that this man and his family were a family who were in perpetual rebellion against God. And the Bible tells me that in a coming day, all those that, that rebel, rebel against God will share a similar fate. I want to read from Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, 
It says, whoever shall offend, verse 42, one of these little ones who believe in me, it will be better for him that a millstone be hanged around his neck and he will cast into the sea. If your hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. I want you to notice this, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter life, uh, in, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire which never shall be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. 47. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched interesting isn't it this man was eaten by worms and three times in that little section it tells us that those that will suffer eternal punishment it says the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched and that's why it's so important to not be a rebel but instead to submit to the claims of Jesus Christ, who came to save rebels, the worst rebels. And how did he do that? By taking the punishment that the rebel deserved. He came to a place called Calvary in full submission, not in rebellion, but in submission to his father in heaven. And he went to that cross. And in that, on that cross, he bore in his own body our sin. And it tells us that if we just simply believe in him, we will not perish. We will not suffer the worm dying not, the fire not being quenched for all eternity. We won't go through that. If we believe in him, we will not perish. But instead, we will have eternal life. Amen. And so it's a wonderful thing to think that the Lord would love people like us enough to take the punishment that should have been ours. But the question is, have you personally accepted Christ as your Savior? You see, you can't get it through your family lineage. What you actually get from your family lineage is what Herod got. Like one, one generation after another, they're rebels against God. And every generation that's born, it's a new group of rebels that need to be saved. And salvation is not passed on from one generation to another, but rebellion and sin is. But salvation is a personal matter between you and God. Will you trust in the Lord Jesus who paid the ultimate price for your sin? And for those of us that are saved, uh, the message is very simple, isn't it? If we read this chapter and we read the book of Acts and we, we think we're New Testament Christians, then we ought to be like the New Testament Christians. And one thing that I can tell you from the book of Acts is that they were a people who were a people of prayer. You want to go forward? Hudson Taylor, when he was asked how he proposed to go into inland China with the gospel, he simply said this, we go forward on our knees. That's how we're going to do it. No special techniques, no fancy uh, ideas. We're just going to go forward on our knees in dependence upon God to show us what to do. And his spirit leads in different ways. As we saw, first time Peter's released, go preach all the words of this life. Second time he goes and he takes a low profile. Sometimes God wants us to hide ourselves. Sometimes God wants us to show ourselves. We have to know when to do what. And the only way we know that is that dependent life. And that dependent life is dependence on God in prayer and dependence on the leading of the Spirit of God. You see it all the way through the book of Acts. This is New Testament Christianity. If we want it, then we've got to ask ourselves, how serious are we about prayer? Let's just pray now. Our Father, we're thankful for your word. And uh, again, Lord, we just we need your help to not only understand the text, but to how to apply it. You've said that the wise man is not the one that hears your word, but the one who hears it and does it. And Father, we confess that so often we've been good at hearing, 
and a little remiss in the doing part. Uh, Lord, help us. We want that to change. Uh, we want to be doers. That's where the blessing is. And we ask for thy help. Lord, as we think of these chapters, we think about famine, the end of chapter 11, persecution, chapter 12. And it looks a, a lot like what's forecast for our present world in many ways. But we're thankful, too, for the hope of a great escape, that there's a day coming when that trumpet will sound and we'll be snatched away. And no man will be able to hold us back or prevent it. Oh, Father, what a blessed hope we have in your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for these truths in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.